So I'm going to talk to you today about heating and cooling curves. And we're going to do a general introduction here in the video, and we'll talk more about it in class. But I have here four uh, curves. This one is for chlorine, this one's for water, this one's for sodium chloride, and this one's for gold. All of these are heating curves because we are starting at a low temperature and working our way up. Now, if these were the mirror images, so for example, if the curve was going like this, that would be a cooling curve because the temperature is dropping. They are exactly the same, the direction is different, and they're just mirror images of each other. Now, what this shows us is it shows us a relationship between temperature and physical state. So what we have right here in all of these curves have the same general shape and it's always gonna have the same kind of setup. This part down here, so the first part with the increasing slope always represents a solid. The second part right here, not right there, the second part right here with the increasing slope is gonna represent a liquid. And then the third part with the increasing slope on all the curves represents a gas. So this part is very logical. As time goes on, as we increase time and increase energy or heat added, what happens is the temperature increases. Now we have to remember that temperature is a measure of kinetic energy, which is also particle movement. So if I increase the temperature, the particles are moving more quickly. And logically, that all makes sense, right? So if I start with something at a solid at negative 200, I add energy to it, they're gonna move faster, and they're going to increase their temperature. What we really need to focus on is these sections here, the plateau, the flat sections. Each of these represent phase changes. Now this, it represents melting because we are going from a solid to a liquid. And this represents boiling, more technically vaporization. Now at this point, at the point where the curve is flat, both phases can be present. So if we're talking about water, at zero degrees C, I can have ice and I can have liquid water. They both can coexist there, but it takes energy to go between ice and the liquid water. So we're adding energy here, but the temperature is not increasing. So the question is, is where is that energy going? Well, we have to think back to what we learned about intermolecular forces. So if we have a solid, the particles are packed very, very tightly together. They're held in a fixed position and just vibrate. And remember, we have intermolecular forces that are holding those particles in place. And in water, those forces are very, very strong because we have hydrogen bonding. When I put that energy in at the phase change, what happens is the intermolecular forces are broken. This can't be represented by kinetic energy because we're not dealing with particle movement. Instead, we're going to the intermolecular forces. This is a measure of potential energy. So as I add energy to the system and as I go this way across any of the phase changes, and we're talking about the melting part here. I'm putting energy in, I'm increasing the potential energy of the system. So energy goes in to melt it. Now, as soon as that last intermolecular force is broken, all of the solid is turned into a liquid. Now we get an increase in temperature again. Particles are gonna move faster. They're going to move faster, faster, faster until it reaches the boiling point. Then we're going to get this equilibrium here, and we're gonna have at 100 degrees C, 
we have water or liquid water, I should say, and steam present together. So I can have liquid water at 100 degrees C. I can have gas or steam at 100 degrees C. Then once all of that water is converted into steam, the temperature can go up in theory indefinitely. Okay, so this area here represents kinetic energy. And if we're going up the curve, it's increasing kinetic energy. This is increasing potential energy, increasing kinetic, increasing potential, increasing kinetic. The flat part represents a phase change and it's flat because the temperature isn't going to particle movement, it is going to breaking intermolecular forces. Okay, so now the question is, is how do I calculate the energy changes for each part of this curve? If I am dealing with any point in the curve where the temperature is increasing, so we are dealing with an area of the curve where I am within a single phase, so increasing the temperature within a solid, within a liquid, within a gas, I can use Q, which is just the heat or the energy change, equals mc delta T. And I'm going to do these in different colors for a reason, and you're going to see that in a second. So the formula is the same. I can very easily get the mass of the substance because I can just put it on a balance. I can determine the initial and the final temperature. And remember the delta, that triangle T is always final minus initial. So you get the final temperature and the initial temperature. And then I need to use C, which is specific heat. And remember specific heat is the energy needed to raise one gram of a substance, one degree C or one Kelvin. Now, one thing you have to pay attention to is specific heat is state dependent, physical state dependent. So the specific heat for steam, well, let me use that color, and for steam is 1.996. Specific heat for liquid water is 4.18, actually it should be 4.184. And the specific heat for ice is 2.108. It's different based on the substance. Okay, it takes different amount of energy to move those particles faster when you're in a different physical state. And we've already done practice with Q equals MC delta T working with the specific heat lab. Now, when we get to this section here and this section here, we're not getting a temperature change. So I can't use Q equals MC delta T. Now remember, this area is a measure of kinetic energy. This is potential energy. And potential energy doesn't register as an increase in temperature. Now, in order to do those calculations, what I need to do is I need to use either the heat of fusion of ice. Heat of fusion of ice is the energy to melt one mole of a solid. Heat of vaporization is the energy required to vaporize or boil one mole of a substance. Now, if I'm going the reverse direction, so if I'm going down, this value is the same. It's just called heat of solidification. If I'm going from a liquid to a solid, it would be called heat of condensation if I am going from gas to a liquid. Now this can be used as a conversion factor. So if I know the particular mass of a sub of, a, of what I have, mass of say ice. So let's say I have 18.02 grams of ice that I wanna melt. Well, what I would need to do is I would need to convert that to moles. So one mole is 18, 0.02 grams, and I purposely picked this so I don't have to do any hard math here. Um, if I'm talking about melting, I'm going to use heat of fusion, and it would be 6.01 kilojoules per one mole. So it would take 6.01 kilojoules to melt 18 grams of ice. Now, the lab we're doing is in some ways very, very similar to what we did last time with the specific heat of the metal. But instead of using a metal, we're using an ice cube, or what's actually, it's pieces of ice. We're actually gonna be using little chunks of ice. So what we're gonna do is we are going to take in our beverage vessel that we're using, 
or our calorimeter, we're going to take a set amount of water and we're going to use warm water. Now, I purposely chose numbers that were not in the lab so that I could demonstrate what we're doing without giving you the answers. Um, you're going to use about 50 degree water um, here. So let's say for this example, we have 250 grams of water at about 60 degrees C. You're going to be using 100 grams of water in the lab. And then I have a sample of ice. So I have 125 grams of ice. And we're going to assume that that's at zero degrees C. I'm going to put the ice into the water. All of the ice is going to melt. And the final temperature is 13.6 degrees. Now we're going to have to then take that information to calculate the energy required to melt this sample of ice. In order to do this problem, we need to picture or visualize that the warm water is one system and the ice melting is another system. So the warm water, I can very easily calculate the Q for the water, for the energy change for that warm water, okay? And that is just Q equals MC delta T. So I would take the mass of the water, which is 250 grams. C for the water is 4.184. And I have to make sure I'm using the specific heat for liquid water. And my delta T, and we have to be very careful with signs, is final temperature, which is 13.6. Its initial temperature was 60 degrees C. So that is the amount of energy that that warm water lost to the melting of the ice and bringing that melted ice up to 13.6 degrees. And so this value is negative 48534 joules. I'm not going to worry about significant figures quite yet. Okay. Now, this right here is the amount of energy that the warm water lost, and it lost it to two places. It lost it to melting the ice, which means I went from ice at zero degrees C to water at zero degrees C. And then it also went to increasing the temperature of that sample of ice water so increasing ice water from zero degrees C to 13.6 degrees C. I can very easily calculate this by using Q equals MC delta T. And that's what this part of the equation is right here. Okay. okay. And that's what this whole thing represents up here. The Q for the warm water is equal to the Q to increase the temperature of the ice water plus the energy needed to melt the ice to go from solid to liquid. Now I'm going to calculate this value and I think I'll keep it in green just to sort of separate it. Oh my gosh, all that noise in the background are my cats like just going bonkers. All right. So Q for the cold water to increase the temperature of the water from zero to 13.6 is going to be 125 grams because that's what the mass of the ice was. We're still going to use 4.184 because it, it is water, but it's just water at zero degrees C. Now my final temperature is 13.6. My initial temperature was zero. Now when I get this value, I get 7113 joules. So now what I can do is if I subtract that from this value, okay, I know now the energy it took to melt the ice. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to use an absolute value here. Okay, we're going to look at absolute terms. So now, and I'll do this in red because that's going to represent this part here. The energy to melt the ice 
is going to be 48534 minus 7113. And I get a value of 41421 joules. So that is the energy needed to melt the sample of ice. Oh, I just let me just erase that again and write it more neatly. 41421 joules, which is the energy needed to melt the ice. Now that I know the energy to melt the ice, and I'll keep doing this in red, so I have 41421 joules. I want to figure out what this is, well, how this relates to the heat of fusion. Now, this is similar to, this is a similar way to figure this out as when we did like molar mass of an unknown substance. The molar mass of a sample, a molar mass of a substance is grams per mole. So if I know how many grams, I know how many moles, I can get a molar mass. Well, heat of fusion has a unit of kilojoules per mole. So if I know how many kilojoules I have, and I know how many moles I have, I divide the two, I can get my constant, my heat of fusion. So the 41421 is joules. I can convert that to kilojoules by dividing by a thousand, because there's a thousand joules in a kilojoule. And I get 41.421 kilojoules. And then I can figure out the moles of ice that I had, because I had 125 grams of ice. The molar mass of ice is 18.02, so which means I have 6.937 moles. So now I have the unit kilojoule, I have the unit mole. I can now get the heat of fusion. So my heat of fusion is going to be 41.421 kilojoules divided by 6.937 moles, and I get a value of 5.97 kilojoules per mole. It should be 6.01, so the data that I chose to use works really well. Now, you are probably not going to get a fantastic significant uh, percent error on this, uh, this lab, there's a lot of errors. It works. It, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong. So don't ex if if you don't get a good percent error, don't worry about it. I'm going to be looking more at your calculations than at your results. But I want you to get this idea of heat of fusion, so the energy needed to melt the ice, plus the energy needed to raise the temperature of that ice water from zero to the final temperature, is going to be equal overall to the energy that's given off by the warm water. Okay, today's lab, we are going to be determining the heat of fusion of ice. So basically, it's the amount of energy needed to melt ice. And we're going to be comparing that to the known value. So the equipment that we're going to use today is we have a thermometer. We have um, crucible tongs. Might not be able to have to use them, but we might. Um, a balance. We're going to need some paper towel. A beaker of hot water. Our calorimeter, which is our beverage tumbler and some ice. And then I also have a weighing dish, which is just gonna be used to estimate the amount of ice. It's the procedure itself is very, very easy. Essentially, we are watching ice melt. Uh, so first thing we're gonna do is we're going to mass the empty calorimeter. And so I have a mass of 194.52. And so I'm gonna record that in my data table. I'm going to take a beaker I'm gonna go up to the front of the room to get warm water. All of the faucets in the chemistry room only have cold water. You're gonna need about 50 degree water, so I'll have a source of warm water up at the front of the building, and 50 degree is, is not enough to get you burnt, but we do want warm water, like warm bath water, okay? What we're gonna do is we're going to add approximately 100 grams. I'm actually just gonna add it through the hole here until I am at about 294. Okay, so now I've added the 100 grams. I'm gonna tilt it so all the water's in the calorimeter. 
and I have 296.29. I'm going to take my thermometer and take the sleeve off, get the initial temperature of my water. I can take that off the balance. My initial temperature of the water is 47.6, and then I'll record that in my data table. Now I'm going to need to get approximately 50 grams of ice, and the reason why we have this weighing dish is I'm using this chipped ice, this little small pieces down from the training room. Your directions say to use three pieces of ice. I don't have three pieces of ice, but about 50 grams is what, is what can fill the weighing dish about even with the top. Now what you're gonna do, it's very important that this is dry. So after I've put it in the dish and I've estimated about the 50 grams, just put it on the paper towel and just sort of make sure that excess water is gone. And then I'm gonna take my lid off and I'm going to dump my ice in, making sure you get as much in as possible. You're getting it all in actually. Put the lid in. I'm going to swirl, put my thermometer in, and I'm going to swirl until the temperature reaches, stops changing, until it reaches the lowest point it can reach. Um, so we're getting to that point now. We're at, so I'm at about nine degrees. Now the reason why I said you might or you might not need the tongs, we're getting a little lower, is if there's any un melted ice in there. When it comes to the temperature stops changing, you need to take that ice out, okay? Well, I don't think there is. It's all melted, so it makes our life real easy. So you're going to record the lowest temperature it gets, swirling a little bit. So right now it's at 8.4. And then you're gonna take that out, put it back on the balance, get the mass. So from all these masses, I can get the mass of the initial water and the mass of the ice that was melted. That's the whole lab. You are gonna do that three times. So you're then going to take the water, you're gonna dump it out, you're gonna dry off the calorimeter, repeat two more times. So this lab should be very quick, um, and this is the data that we're collecting, and this is what we're gonna work with to determine the heat of fusion of ice.